All right. Hey, guys, uh, this is Anthony Bandiero here, uh, attorney and senior legal instructor for Blue Gold Law Enforcement Training. Uh, welcome to the Search and Seizure Show, where we ask, uh, answer your questions live. We have some pre you know, pre-written questions and so forth. Joined by my friend. Mike Boone. I, uh, I work for Blue to Gold. Yep. A legal instructor and uh, part-time gig as a full-time officer still. Now, you uh, <laughs> you have retirement in your wings. I'm looking that. Yeah, yep. I'm coming up on 21 years and... We're going to wind Change. it up pretty soon. Wind it up pretty soon. And then uh, you're going to become a full-time instructor for us? That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> and then our latest full-time instructor is Zach Miller. Um, now, Rick, can, can you also, I don't know if you can fix it on our end with the uh, the OBS. But anyway, Zach, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, uh, Zach Miller. I'm out here in Virginia, Williamsburg area. I uh, was a police officer for 19 years and uh, retired early so that I can do this full-time. I've um, been yep. doing it for a little over a year now and love it. Absolutely. How, how many years have you been full time? Just a little over a year um, doing it on my own, but with you guys since, well, a few months. Well, now. January, you know, January. Yeah, so January. Forth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I've been doing this full time since, uh, well, 2016. Um, but there was law school mixed in there for the first three years, but I have pretty much been on the road every week. I mean, even COVID, I traveled a lot. I mean, it didn't, it didn't break my stride as much as you would think um since august of 2019 hmm. so i definitely have a lot of miles yeah so how is it on the other side zach is it good it's great i, I have not regretted it one i enjoyed my 19 years i really did i uh, wasn't quite ready to go but i have no regrets that's awesome yeah all right so rick are we good to go a little bit out of focus. yeah it's a little bit of focus okay hey so um we're doing that soft focus. actually sean remembers my first roadside chat that's that's awesome. And then I think now we have the uh, the white Wait, square on it. John, you've been a stalker that long? Man, that's incredible. Wow. Well, yeah, that was during COVID. <laughs> that's awesome. That was during COVID. And, uh, nice. Yeah, how far? Was that, we... was that the leather jacket in the car? Let's see, Sean. Yeah, actually, see if that, Sean could, remembers. that could have been. Yeah, in yeah. the car, yeah. The leather, well, I think while you were driving, you're driving too, right? It was a true, like. Oh, <laughs> I did, yes. So people actually made fun of They're like, hey, you know, you, you, know you're, <laughs> you could, like, if you crash or something like that. But then I see people doing it all the time they're talking and driving yeah, cool. so why are you give me a hard time yeah, i don't know <laughs> all right so does anybody have a question and we can put them on the mic and answer it live i want to let's answer some questions live yeah here you go yeah exact you said we had somebody right from yeah, the, do you remember? The webinar? yeah um matthew had asked a question i don't know if he's still with us he had a good question about abandonment all right tow. matthew put uh rick yeah, put matthew matthew on, on the line Matthew Ferguson. Here we go. All right, ready? Ooh, lots of people. Yeah, we have a good, we have a good number of people here. So, I like it. All right, Matt, you should see it on your end. Just to unmute yourself. Matt, hello, Matt. He goes next. All right, do me do me a favor, Rick. Um, e uh, text Matt my cell phone number, let him call in, and I'll put him on speaker. And then let's put uh, you said Diego. So Matt, right. for, since a technical difficulty, so, don't worry, Matt. It's just, the theme. It's the theme for tonight, Matt. That's okay. Just just <laughs> call me on my. Can you call me? I'll give you my phone number. But let's do Diego first, and then Rick will uh, text you my phone number in the chat. Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? Good, man. What state are you from? You're East Coast. Colorado. Uh, Colorado. Oh, I would have. I, I, I kind of felt that. Middle like East, Coast. I felt that, that East Coast vibe from it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. I was totally off on that. What's up, my friend? <laughs> uh, dude, I got, a, I got a question for you that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. Well, let's do it. Uh-oh. All right. So just like everybody else here, no fentanyl's killing everybody else with just work-related stuff. Uh, so here in Colorado, how we used to be able to search cars under marijuana and all that good stuff, where a lot of people still can, but we can't, uh, with fentanyl, when someone's recently smoked it, I mean, there's, you have a physical change, right? You, we search that car, we're getting lightheaded. Uh, there's a unique smell, you know, I don't have enough time right now to articulate it as I don't know how I would, uh, yeah. something similar to, to popcorn, maybe, right? Some, some burnt popcorn, a little funky. Um, with a lot of these cars, sometimes we're in PC, we're not getting PC to search the car. Would you say that based off of the physical reactions that the officers are getting from smelling that, 
that that would give us PC enough to search that vehicle. That's a definitely arguable probable cause for sure, right? Like, I mean, because right. you're attributing it to something that you, as a known substance, as a mm -hmm. legal, right? You know, I, I know when I've smelled this, uh, would you say popcorn? Something like, I mean, I have a burnt, It's funny because I have uh, certain, it's like cocaine to me, it smells like drywall. Mm. I've heard. <laughs> you 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 work narcs. Oh yeah, I work narcs for a few minutes. Yeah, you have a reason to say that. Um, huh. I, it, it's interesting you think that. I mean, well, that factor alone, you know, is going to be part of. Well, look, I, I I know. I look, I can tell you, and I want Zach's opinion on it because he's the uh, he's he, he re recently retired. But I know we have cases where cops said that they smelled um, kitty litter. Um, no, uh, urine, uh, cat, 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 cat yeah. urine, and because of a meth lab, mm -hmm. and the courts upheld that as yeah, part of probable cause. Experience. You can attest that that smell is is that. Yeah. What, mm -hmm. what do you think, Zach? It, it all goes to to the off the individual officer's experience with that particular substance, and his and 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 you know, it sounds like Diego has um, some experience with it. So you know, what what is your history with with that particular odor? And and the best that you can describe it and analogize it, I think, is the best. Uh, best evidence, but yeah, I think if that that odor by itself, with your ability to identify that with a fentanyl, is probable cause. Yeah, as now, long as you um, also particularize it to the source. I'd say, oh, of course, because we're, we're not Diego. just getting the odor; we're getting the, <laughs> the, the physical behavior from us. You know, we're having to separate ourselves from the vehicle, give us give ourselves some time. You know, rather than marijuana, you smell it, and it's just a. Uh, distinct odor but when we go in a car like that yeah, i mean you're getting lightheaded and getting dizzy and... yeah yeah <laughs> so the the way so one like um shortcut that i do for my students as far as hey do we have probable cause to search a car is i just i usually just ask the student i say hey okay what if you just took the time to go get a warrant right and you told the judge everything you know do you think that your judge or a judge right but your judge would give you a warrant let me ask you that. And looking at it that way, do you think you have enough facts and circumstances to convince a judge that there's likely contraband in that vehicle based on your reaction, the smell of the popcorn, and all this other stuff? I'd say so, 100. percent Well, if you if you're that confident, then you have probable cause. There you go. Now you could be wrong. No, look, you know, you know, so judges and and sort of get paid to you know kind of Monday morning quarterback your that's what the motor vehicle exception is, right? You you take that risk that you are you are assessing probable cause on your own. And then when you go to court, the judge says, I think you are right or I think you are wrong. That's what U.S. versus Ross says. They will judge it later. But if a cop are confident that they have probable cause and they could get a warrant, then search the car. Right. I mean, Zach, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the, the probable cause uh, test is no different before a judge or a magistrate than it is for a, for a warrantless search. Probably so probably. Mike, let's look at Mike. Uh, Mike Brave. He's he's an expert witness in this, you know, this space. He says, are you ready to testify as to your olfactory um, senses and cognitive states? I suggest you do not want to do that. I get it. Look, I I, I get it. But I, I think we have to kind of get the, you know, I understand that. And maybe it's going to be a, a, a tough suppression hearing. But the cop is saying something that's true. And if I just it, it's true. I mean, you know, every I mean. Maybe at one point marijuana was that, you know, in 1876, you know, the first cop to smell marijuana. I don't know. But and the first cop to smell methamphetamine lab, somebody has to break that kind of um, and introduce mm -hmm. that that the smells and so forth. So I, I, I'm personally fine with it. Perfect. I'll let you know when I make case law. Well, just don't die doing it. You know, yeah, what I, mean? Yeah, like... I mean, you got this like, you know, you got like this fan blowing on you. It's like full air from the vehicle so you can. Don't, you know. be the, don't be the canaries, all right? Yeah, don't be the canary. <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome, my friend. Hey, um, what's the other officer that's going to call me? Matt. Matt, give me a call. And then who else? Uh, let's get somebody else on deck. Hold on. Hey, Matt. Hey, how's it going, man? Good, brother. All right, where are you, uh, where are you from? Uh, uh, Wichita County, Texas. That's from North, North Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wichita, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. All right, what you got? So my my question was regarding the uh, abandoned vehicles that we were talking about earlier, but um, our agency has a forty eight hour warning that will affect. So if we have an abandoned vehicle on the highway, we'll, we'll stamp that with the forty eight hour sticker. My question is: is it is it safe to assume that, according to our policy and our our practices, that that every vehicle up until that forty eight hour uh, 
48 hours would like every vehicle would, would actually be abandoned at that point. Well, I know my answer, but I, I want uh, my guests to take a stab at this first. Uh, Mike, what do you, what do you got on this? Hang on. So is it up until the 48 hours or past the 48 hours? I think past the 48 hours. Past, past, yeah, past the 48, past 48 hours. hours. So basically, the, you know, our friend here is saying, hey, can we kind of have a bright line rule mm. that after 48 hours, that is constitutionally mm. abandoned? And what do you want to what do you want to do with this car? You want to you want to start, for example, search it. Well, it, it, I don't mean it. I don't I don't have anything. Yeah, just a, it's more of a, a, a I can have a question. Like if we did search it, right? Let's say, yeah. So, yeah go ahead. So like our whenever you are talking about the the, uh, the motel incident from earlier, I guess the guy supposedly left the, the car there. Mm. Um, he jumped into another car. He was there for six days. At that point, Zach was like, I would, I would consider it abandoned at that point. Right. And that, that's when my question came in is, our agency will sit there and impound for anything that's past 48 hours after we hit, hit that sticker on it. Is it safe to assume that all vehicles at that point, bright line rule would be abandoned? I think the statute has helped clean it up kind of by saying, all right, past this here. Now you've kind of gone beyond that. Like, you know, you talked about constitutional and, and, uh, in doing so, I think right. I think there could be some other factors in there. Like, is what's the condition of the vehicle? The driver. Yeah, there, I mean, there could be some other right. things in there. Hey, going to get gas and there's a note. There's, 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 there's a note. So you know, I got to have to walk all the way across Texas right. to get gas. I'll be back in right. 48 hours. So I think there's some considerations there, but I think that's going to help with some of the articulation and the abandonment in that. Uh, what do you think, Zach? Are we telling these vehicles all prop private property? Or are these like abandoned vehicles on the side of the road? I mean, because that, that's a big difference. You know, two days on the side of the road. You know, we're towing that for for safety reasons, and that's that's an inventory search, obviously. So, I mean, that's that's abandoned in the statutory sense. But a car that's been sitting in a parking lot at a motel for two days, you know, I, that, I'm not sure. Well, they wouldn't that. be. I don't think statutorily they would be abandoned at that. Or they statutorily yeah. the forty hour forty hour rule wouldn't apply because we the state does not care about forty eight hours in private property. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a, some kind of public street. Yeah, well, then that's public yeah, that's, safety yeah. concern to Sa that's safety. That's safety. Yeah. Say what, Zach? That's that's more of a safety issue. That's that's a community caretaking endeavor there, and that's just we're and then we're towing the car to to get it off the road. Now that brings the inventory search. So I don't think this is really an abandonment issue, in the constitutional sense of the word. It's more of a is it reasonable to seize this vehicle? Question. What do you think, Matt? I I, I agree. I mean, so my, I I was kind of getting to the point of like this. Does that vary agency to agency based on their policies and procedures? Because I mean, our, ours is forty-eight hours. I'm, I don't know what every other agency works on, but so that's policy. Um, sure. So I, I got to tell you. So so generally speaking, courts don't really consider your policy, or even definitely not policy, mm -hmm. but oftentimes not even state law when it comes to the Fourth Amendment. They care, you know. They they you know, it's it's a factor, but it's not a huge factor, right? You know. Um, in other words, you can't get rid of people's rights just because the law says you don't have any rights. You know what I mean? Um, yes, if that was the case, people, the, a state like California would say, Hey, we can search your car, um, at any time to look for handguns. You know, you are now on, you know, illegal handguns. You are now on notice that if you enter our state, this statute, this penal code says we can search your car. So, um, the 48 hour rule to me. It's I don't I don't put a lot of stock in it. I mean, it's if you're, you're going to tow it, then use community caretaking, like Zach said. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying I'm not going to tow it, but I just want to search it anyway, you know, that's the mentality. That's the that's a legal question. It's no. I, it, we have to look at that vehicle. I mean, if this thing is a McLaren, and mm -hmm. there's a note on it that says this tire is hard to order. I have to order from Japan. It's going to take you know seven days. You know, I'm just I'm being funny here, but it's mm -hmm. like it, it. Or if it's a 1992 Honda Accord. And all the windows are busted out, and it looks, you know, it has four flat tires. The thing is, we have to look at totality of circumstances. Just because it's there for 40 hours and now it can be towed, that's community caretaking, not abandoned. Okay. And it so all depends on the totality of circumstances. I mean, um, it all, all depends. I mean, it's so it's, it's reasonable, prudent based on circumstantial. Yeah, it's objective. Like, yeah. ob and it's also objective. It's like objectively, a reasonable person would look at this vehicle and believe that the owner of it, you know, the whoever was driving this thing wants nothing to do with it anymore. You know, and how do you know that? Because the doors are unlocked. Because the keys are in it. We I've seen that before. I mean, I've seen keys oh, in cars, right, you know, yeah. just 
Um, Good. Because, because it has no, this anymore. <laughs> yeah, because it seems like it has very low economic value. But the 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 car with the twenty four inch the, the the Escalade with the twenty four inch rims that has a flat tire, that's not going to be abandoned probably in forty hours. That's just going to be a guy looking to try to figure out how he's going to change this unique tire. I mean, I mean, it's, the point is it's it's objective. It's not it's not what the law says. It's what you think is kind of going on there, and you have to justify it objectively. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So who else? Who, who do we have on deck, Rick? So what does Zach have? So do we have a? Uh, oh, that's a. He's answering Brave. Oh, yeah, I was just following to, to Michael Brave. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Does any? Okay. So let's uh, answer a question. All right. Um. So this question, you know, you might not have these, Zach, but that's that's okay. Um, an officer. This is a question uh, out of North Carolina. An officer finds a business door unlocked, no broken glass, and no forced entry. Another officer responds to an alarm call to the residents. Wait, wait, hold on. Why is this a business? An officer finds a business <laughs> door unlocked, no broken glass. Another officer responds to an alarm. I feel like these are se scenarios. separate things here. It looks like yeah, we get going. Both ways. Oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. okay. So one's a business door unlocked. One is a, a residence. Unlocked an door and no forced entry. Okay, so basically I think we're just trying to, hey, what's the baseline here? Oh, okay. One's a business alarm. Mm. One's a residence alarm, but there's no signs of forced entry either one, right? Right. Can an officer go in and look in closets under beds to see if anyone's in the residence or the or the business? It's not the best worded question, but I understand mm -hmm. what the cop means. Yeah. Uh, so when we look at these alarm calls, I think there's there's something to be said when you when you put an alarm on your house or your business mm -hmm. that when it goes off, you're hoping for well at least the uh, security guards to come by or whatever the security agents. We'd also hope to get ABT a, and so forth. Yeah, but also to get a response from a police agency. There, there's some kind of you know implied come check out my stuff thing there. Uh, but when you're you're talking about here, the first one I don't even know if there's an alarm call here, but officer finds a business door unlocked. Well, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. I think yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think let's take the business with no mm, alarm. No alarm. It's just it's unlocked door. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you. But maybe it's like cracked open a little bit. Sure. Okay. Right. Uh, Larry forgot to lock up at night or something Correct, like yep. that. Correct, um, yep. I think that just kind of isolated by itself. I'm not seeing a, a, a justifiable need to go inside of there. Uh, you know, we're talking about business, so you get to walk around a little bit and maybe see if there's... Sure. But he said no forced entry, no broken glass, uh, no indicators of that. So I don't see I don't see an urgency, an emergency, nothing that we need to go in there and see what the heck's going on. All right, let's... With, so with that factor. Zach, are you cool with that? Um, what do you think about the business? The business, the door is cracked open. It's closed. The business is closed. Two o'clock in the morning. No signs of... Fort, no, no signs of other nefarious activity. What are you doing there? Uh, I'm not going in on those facts by themselves. You know, I'm calling, a, you know, see if we got an RP, you know, a, a key holder or somebody we can talk yeah. to. But yeah. Announcements. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe announce through the, the door, but... But call yeah, somebody out. But if you got nothing, you got no odd car, you nope. got no, um, you know, history of the car being or the the resident or the or the business being burglarized. You got nothing yeah. like that. We're not going in. I mean, it, it, leave, yeah. a, leave a note on the door and yeah, say hey, we, close were, your, we know, were here. Or you know, we, I like I like I, yeah. you are you are cool with locking the door. Yeah, you know, reaching around, and locking see, it. Yeah. I don't can, see it. Yeah, I don't see any issue with that. No. Yeah, of course. I mean, if they, yeah, if they complain like, oh man, I didn't have a key to that. Now I'm locked out. Then that'll be a tort claim if we want to go that route. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to set up a, uh, <laughs> Amanda. That's funny. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've done that before. Close business at night. Hey, can we get canine around? You know, whatever. More factors. Blow oh. glass. <laughs> Metro police sound off. We'll send in the dog. <laughs> you, you've done the barking. I've done the barking. I've done the barking too. I was chasing this guy, and I'm not a good runner. But I was chasing this guy, and I started barking like a dog, and I was hoping that he would stop. Uh, he 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 probably it sounded like probably a chihuahua yeah. or something. Um, we'll have to we'll have to do a demonstration webinar sometime. That how to bark? I'll show you how to <laughs> how to lock a door with a plastic grocery bag with a deadbolt. You loop it up. You loop it on the inside, and you close the door and you pull it through, and it pulls the deadbolt bolt over. That's awesome. Lock door. That's that's awesome. Okay, now what about um, what about the residents? This is right, more, so, so the so, residents that we have the alarm. Yep. Okay, we got the alarm going off. Uh, unlocked door, no signs of forced entry. Um, you know the same thing. We talk about like an alarm, alarm and you know, is there is there some other factor like you said? Is there a, a car? Is there a neighbor saying, hey, you know, they're out of town. There shouldn't be anybody around. We saw somebody out there earlier. Um, yeah, there's no signs of forced entry. I still want to see just a little bit more. We're going in, like I say, going inside there, looking in closets, under beds, yeah. type thing. Give me, give me that alarm plus something. 
a little more to make that entry. something more than just an alarm. Mm -hmm. um, is that because ninety eight percent of these are false yes, alarms? That's a, that's a lot to do. With is it. that because your experience says that these are probably bogus? <laughs> and it's, it's probably not worth killing a homeowner yeah. and, and, and surprising them. What do you think, Zach? Definitely. What's your move here? Uh, oh, I, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. I'd say ninety nine and a half percent alarm calls I ever went on were were false alarms. So mm -hmm. now, yeah. now when I read when I read case law on these on the home uh, alarms, I actually read. A lot of them actually uphold it. They're still, in though. favor. Of it. They're in favor. Of it. They mm -hmm. call it, you know, that either a implied consent, mm -hmm. um, because you know you you have okay, I've got my alarm. Company. You yeah you you know it's a it's a it's mm -hmm. a, um, or there's some kind of form of agency. But I I don't teach that in 2024. I mean, well, like how many said, of those you think are pre Canelia versus Strom though that maybe oh, rely uh, all on of them the oh, every right. single every single one is yeah pre we went under yeah, yeah. yeah. actually yeah. actually Zach I didn't think about that. Oh, those cases you're referencing? I hundred percent. I did not think that these are all pre connected mm. cases. Uh, so now, you, yeah. now that you opened that door and you yeah. brought in some case law and dropped some knowledge, now explain oh, to our viewers yeah. here what is that case in a nutshell? Yeah. Why did you bring up that case and why is it important yeah, so to our discussion? Caniglia, Caniglia, whatever it is, versus Strom was the case where the Supreme Court held that the the community caretaking exception does not apply to home entry. Uh, it originated with the vehicles in, in Dabrowski, uh, but a significant number of the court, lower courts, state and, and federal courts had, uh, had upheld home entries under the community caretaking exception. And the court said categorically it does not apply to homes. So we're left with the emergency aid exception, which is, is, is similar, but there are some, you need probable cause or something to the close to that effect. Close to it, yeah. That someone is in need of immediate assistance inside the house or substantial property damage is about to occur. Yep. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Or, prote or protect people. Cases, it's substantial property damage, but, or protect people's property, but. Protect their yeah. property from theft, yeah. and we don't have those facts. Yeah. Um, and again, right. we let's be real here: the vast majority of these cases, these calls, are absolutely bogus, and people don't know how to turn off their alarm, or somebody's checking on the house, and they don't know how to yeah. turn it off. Okay. No. But hey, like you said, the outcome, the alternative. Of yeah, it's not. It's not worth it. Bad deal. Okay. Hey, that was good, man. Um, that was awesome. I'm, I'm glad you brought Caniglia, and that. that's a good. That's a good twist. Okay. Next officer. And then if we have do, Rick, do we have anybody that needs to uh, come on the mic? Okay. We have Amanda. Go ahead read this question and then take uh, the next. Which one? Take, take okay. The, okay. The All right, Amanda, hold on. So, uh, Georgia and Georgia. the question is the, 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 anyway, so looks like a famous person. I don't know if you know that name, but mm -hmm. officers respond to a stolen vehicle uh, stolen vehicle recovery call in a high crime area during the night shift. So let me make sure. Respond to a stolen vehicle recovery call in a high crime area. Okay. okay. During during graveyard or whatever. Officers observed the stolen vehicle parked in the driveway. Oh, snap. Mm. Officers knocked on the door of the residence to speak with any occupants. The door opens after knocking. Maybe they're related to the other call. Mm. After announcing their presence and received no response outside the threshold, they step inside. Dun, dun, dun. I love this. Make another announcement and still receive no response. The officers have a right to check the location for signs of crime or a person needing assistance. Now, oh, come on, this is easy. I mean, um, this is this is one on one stuff. That, we, we we ain't going no. into that house, <laughs> right, Zach? I mean, we're no, not walking um, to that. We're not even all close. Over this. Yeah. yeah. But no, Anthony, what's, what's your reason to believe? Like, yeah. What's your reason to believe there's actually someone in there? No, we're not speculating here. We're yeah. There's so much speculation. I mean, I guess the only thing is it's a high crime area and the door isn't locked all the way. Well, that's why it's high crime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be high crime oh, if you locked your doors. Wait, did their alarm go off? <laughs> right. I mean, give me no. Yeah, you know, we ain't all. we ain't going in this thing. That's an easy one, man. Mm -hmm. Come on. I mean, you know, you knock on the door and it opens, and now what? I mean, you know why you're going in there. You just want to probably, you know. Uh, Probably arrest me for the stolen car. I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, um, since we're here, Zach, what about uh, taking that car with you? So, calling the tow truck and having the tow the car. Speaking of Virginia, yeah. Um, speaking of oh, yeah, Collins. Well, I think this is. I think we're. No, Ryan, we're awfully, don't you yeah, what? I, yeah, I know the officers that were involved in Collins. I've actually spoken. Oh, to that's them. cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think the plain view doctrine applies here. I'm lawfully on the curb. I'm assuming the car is on the route oh. to the front door. Yeah, yeah. And if if I'm lawfully on the curtilage uh, under the plain view doctrine, 
You know, if, if, if I have probable causes to believe this vehicle is stolen, I'm going to place them allowed to be. I'm not further intruding uh, on, a, on a protected interest. I don't think you need a warrant to tow the car. Um, we can debate whether you need a warrant to search it um, post Collins, but this isn't Collins. This is different. So just, I mean, so you don't see any issue if you're in a house during a domestic violence call, okay? Mm -hmm. And you see a stolen couch in plain view. Yes. I'm just, I guess, I guess it's fine, right? You think you can call the movers in from yes. Henry's moving company and say, hey, come on in this house and help me move this couch out. Yes, because I'm not further intruding. It's, I'm, I mean, I have to, I have to call resources to help me move the, the item just because of its sheer size. Do you think but you have I'll to stay in the house in order for uh, the, the movers to come in? Or can you yeah. wait in your black and white until they show up with the moving? No, we need to, I think we need to stay in the house. Once you once you seed the ground, I think you need a warrant to return. See, actually, Absolutely. I actually I actually agree with you. I, I think that's and that's one of the reasons I teach cops that they should not uh, do this. with recovering stolen vehicles because I know cops are not going to physically stand in that curtilage and hold the ground. Mm. They're going to go in their black and white and wait for that tow truck to come. The black and white is not going to be on curtilage right. for the most part. And I think right. you lost it. Yeah, I think you need to remain. Someone needs to remain on the property. You know, once you seed ground to re-enter, like back to square one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's probably it's, not it's, literally. See, it's right, probably just, it's, 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 it needs to be continuous. There. It needs to be continuous. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. someone yeah. needs to stay on the property. Yeah, no, I, I look, I will agree with that. Um, but when like the couch example is probably a little easier because you're probably not going to hopefully like leave the house. Mm -hmm. But if you leave it, I think you lost it. And you agree. Even with, even yeah, with I do agree. All right. That. So uh, let's get Amanda on. So I have a question about uh, misleading all, property. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, what do you Just Jeez, I mean, you got no social. You got no social skills. We, in, thought we were all friends I mean, here. You got no social skills in Kansas. <laughs> Jeez, no. Nope. How about how about Howdy? Like, we're not paying for minutes on phones anymore. Are we like we don't have to get to right. it right now. <laughs> minutes on phones. Uh, anyway, good to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, nice to see. Nice to hear from you too, Amanda. Get down to business. Anyway, so about misleading property or lost property. Say you find a flash drive in the Casey's parking lot. Does the Privacy interest in that person's drunk drive outweigh the governmental interest in finding out who the person who owns that drunk drive. Man, you first of all, the kind of the kind uh -oh. of the kind of police services <laughs> you are giving in Kansas is fucking phenomenal. Like, I mean, I don't think your agency is calling people about the thumb drive. Hey, uh, you left your child porn on the, on the parking lot. <laughs> well, that's that's the case I was talking about because that's what we learned about last week. So I was just. I love it. No, <laughs> look. Um, so look, I. So let's. So first of all, if the if the thumb drive is on is in the parking lot of some right, is do you think it's mislaid or do you think it's abandoned? It's lost. Say what? It's lost. Like it just fell out of their car when they got out to pump gas. How do you you know that? Or are you just guessing that? I'm guessing because it's in a parking spot. Or just, I'm just hypothetical here. I think. Look, I know. I know. Mislaid and abandonment are very close. They're they're definitely you know uh, siblings. But I just don't know under these facts when you really don't know. Like it's just in the parking lot. I just I think it might be just abandoned. We, uh, Zach, how are you calling this? You, you calling it I'm, lost or abandoned? I'm I'm leaning mislaid here, and you know, a, a, apart from putting the jump drive in the computer to see if the, it couldn't have some people play like, title it like, like, like Zach's thumb drive, you know, uh -huh. absent that, I don't think you can start going and opening files to try and figure out who this is. I, I think this is mislaid properly. properly. So, so it's protected then it's protected on the fourth amendment. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then, and then you can search it for, I, for who owns it. Yes. To the extent I think, but the, I think that's limited to just inserting it into a, uh, a USB port to see if the if it's titled, you know, because some people like I said some people label it as their name and then thumb drive, but I think I don't think you can open files. I don't know, man. I I I, I hear you, and I, I think it's it's a good argument. But I I can definitely see another argument that this is, I I you know <laughs> without direct We're evidence that they actually. Like I left it there. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle of a parking lot. Right. How do we also know the guy just like I don't want this stupid mm -hmm. thumb drive. It's uh, only a four gigger. I want the nine. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I want the twelve gigs. I, I just yeah. I, I, that's that's an assumption that we're making that they really want 
that thing anymore that it just fell out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think it can go hey, both ways. Hey, hey, so what if you what if you do open it up and the first uh file you come to is CP child porn? Well, then the courts are definitely going to uphold it as abandonment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, probably. But yeah, I mean, you know, look. Uh, so I, I, it definitely can go both ways. You know, objectively, you know, but usually with mislaid, it's there's some evidence that they are looking for it, that they were engaged in lawful activity at the time, and they left it behind. But this thing is in the middle of a parking lot. I, I understand that the odds are probably that the person just dropped out of their pocket. Right. But we're putting a cops in a very tough situation where we're expecting them to do this analysis where it's likely a fell or somebody's pocket or the door. Or I just I think the better objectively is that it's just garbage. Yeah. You know, I think it's garbage. I think that that's what I would say. I, but, I just I think I just think so. Abandonment is is someone has to intentionally relinquish all reasonable expectation of privacy in that item. I think or, if someone is trying to discard a thumb drive and they're not being chased by the police, correct. I think they're going to throw it in the trash can or I don't think they're just going to drop it in the middle of a public parking. But what, park. okay, what about the cases that said that the drug dealer, this is actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the case name, but the drug dealer who put his little uh, drug package, whatever, you know, his, his, um, his uh, container, whatever he put it, he put it in some <laughs> stairs um, to hide it, you know, he he hid it in some stairs in an apartment complex, and then he kind of left and was doing his own little thing. The cops went up there and opened it, and the cops was said, the, 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 "Huh? Was the container? Did, 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 was it like a a single purpose container ish? No, case, it was a uh, just think of like a canvas bag or something. Hmm. But it was okay. kind of hidden in the stairs. Uh, right. We know that that guy was not uh, abandoning that item. Right. However, the court said because you left it in a public place, you have no privacy interest in it." You know, you took this risk that somebody from the general public would come over and open it. They said that was abandoned. But they said okay. that. Um, I mean, so it's just it's just it's it's objective, right? I mean, I don't know. I just I I I think the better argument for me is that if you just lose your USB drive and it falls out of your pocket and it's in the middle of a Walmart parking lot, it's hard for the cop to objectively look at that and start guessing about your intentions. Yeah, what, what happened? How what happened? Yeah. How it must have? Yeah. You know, it's a USB drive. It has value. It must. It must be. Uh, somebody must be searching for it. We we just don't know that. I think you need more facts than assuming that somebody's looking for that thing. Okay. Thank you. See, I have some social skills. I said Say, thank you. Say, oh. oh, now we're ignoring her. Oh, no. Look, now she's getting sassy. You yeah, know what I mean? I like her style. You're most welcome, Amanda. <laughs> um, let's go to <laughs> Cook County, Illinois. Cook County, Illinois. Uh, so is it legal to open the hood of a semi-tractor to acquire the VIN number? A semi-tractor illegally parked, possibly abandoned on the roadway. All right. The VIN check, um, a VIN check to verify status of it stolen possibly issue a parking violation, continue further investigation. So we're going to presume here that this thing has no registration, no registration visible. visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your answer on that? Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about abandonment and vehicles and whatnot tonight. So you're saying possibly abandoned. So we'll take that argument out of mm -hmm. the deal there. Let's we'll take that out of there. So regulatory, right. Um, you know, vehicles, is this on a roadway mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the roadway? Right. So there's some regulatory. He says it's legally parked. Illegally parked on the road, yeah. right? Okay, so there's some enforcement ability on there. Usually when we talk about doing VIN inspections, it's as a result of a, of of a lawful stop. A yeah. lawful stop in doing so. So if there's, I'm looking at this kind of from the point of view of, okay, you've got a, a legal issue with this. It's illegally parked in there um, in, a, in order for us to even cite it. So you're just looking at to hang on, verify status of stolen, possibly issues park documentation. So in order to issue the parking citation, you got to verify that that's the, yeah. the semi itself here. Um, I think there's an investigatory interest. Yeah, look, I, I, yeah. look if, we, if we are not allowed to do anything, then, yeah, the, car, then the truck then stays there forever. There. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're good with this, right, Zach? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem with this one. This yeah. is not class on point, but class has got some good language in it. Well, I mean, to me, to, to me, I, I know the way I look at this is not only class, but I look at this as the good old fashioned motor vehicle exception. I mean, in the sense that we are trying to issue a ticket. Let's say we want to issue a ticket. We can't do it without. We can't the do it without the VIN, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, we, it's, it's, we just want to search for the evidence for the, so we can issue a citation. Yeah, I can go with that too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think class is probably better, but but class applies because we have a lawful 
detainments or you know mm -hmm. seizure temporary seizure of the vehicle we're taking enforcement right. action yeah right so the answer is yes we're, we're good to go all right um question four kansas this question comes from kansas so can occupants of a hotel be advised of criminal trespass if they are long-term residents we have a hotel in our city that is basically running as a long-term stay establishment about three-fourths of the residents pay monthly to stay there. The owners have tried to use us in the past to get those residents out of their hotel when they get behind on the rent or get them or get fed up with them. <laughs> Even though it has been suggested the hotel does not move their long-stay guests room to room each month or even have them check out. Mm. An example of a resident who's been staying there for over a year. All of his belongings are in his room. He gets his mail there. He is registered offender. Is a registered offender, and his address is listed on the offender registry. Even though it has been suggested the hotel does not move them, blah, 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 that's a repeat. Um, I was under the impression that we would have, to, if we want to get them evicted, we would have, we we could not eject them, which is the proper term. Mm -hmm. We cannot eject them. We would actually have to get a, um, we would have to get a eviction orders. Okay. And then actually, there's some state statutes here. Um, man, I actually didn't look at these state statues. That... I looked at, I, I did have a chance to look at this, this first one. Um, and so I, I think in the, the last part of this right here, it talks about that, you know, a DA provided these state statutes and said they apply to all hotel. Hey, yes. um, Amanda, while we're talking about this, look up, you ready for this? I'm gonna give you, get a 36 604. You Rick read it, right? 36 604 and then KSA. And then also 58-2541. 58-2541. And they're both. Uh, Amanda, and, and maybe, uh, so, all right. Let's, Zach, do you want to start looking at those two while we, we talk about this? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. All right, look. So let's start with some ground rules, okay? First of all, this is a very, very common um, issue, Okay. And I'm going to, very, very common. I'm going to tell you. The budget what, tweaklies. Yes, the budget <laughs> tweaklies. So I'm going to tell you what our position in here is at Blue to Gold and what we teach our students. We teach our students that when a hotel, motel, or even the Holiday Inn. I'm sorry. It's, it's such a you, bad joke. You can't help. I mean, <laughs> I can't help myself. It's such. So when, um, when they have allowed a person to stay indefinitely, Right. It's not like, hey, it's not like Cousin Eddie. You're just here for two weeks. Right. For the holidays. When they have essentially allowed this person to stay indefinitely, constitutionally, in my view. That turns into their domicile. That turns into their residence, because now the expectation of privacy is what? It's that of a home. This guy getting his mail there. That is absolutely in my view. That's a home. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you can look at these statutes and you can see if they somehow somehow uh, uh, change the script on this. But that is his domicile. He's expecting that this is all. And, and worse yet, they have allowed it. It's one thing for me to go to the Hilton and just say, put in a change of address. and I'm there for a week. <laughs> and the Hilton, the front desk is like, what are you doing here? Why are you getting your credit card statements here? I'm like, yeah, I, move, I live here yeah, now. I live here now. <laughs> and they're like, no, you do not. You don't live here. That's not going to be a home. But this, to me, constitutionally, under the Fourth Amendment, is a domicile, and um, I don't think you can be ripped out of your home. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm 100% I'm right. I'm just saying what's best practice. I think this is also going to offend a lot of judges who are trying to, for public policy reasons, and 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 mm -hmm. um, so, you know, look. So judges make some decisions based on public policy, right? We do not want to make people homeless mm -hmm. overnight because. Of you know just because they are, have a tiff with the the manager, um, many states Illinois, California, Nevada, um, I th Ohio have thirty day rules. Mm -hmm. That's that rotational part they're talking. Well, about can here. I tell bit, you something? A little bit in there. Okay, but I, I don't think that actually works. Really, I don't think it works in, in most places, and here's why. And, and Zach can tell me if he thinks differently. But these statutes um, about the the. Um, well, these statutes are all about the indefinite stay. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you allow this person to stay over over thirty days, we're going. The law is going to presume that legally they are a tenant, mm -hmm. not a guest. Okay. When the hotel tries to do the whole bait, no, 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 the switch and like the musical chairs things, at the end of the day, do they really know that he does not want to move? 
No, he, he wants he, to stay in the same. He wants to stay there. Yeah, he's only moving because he's being forced to. Mm-hmm. In other words, does he still have the the intent to indefinitely stay at that hotel? Then why is he not complying with the statute? The, the intent of the statute is not to create homelessness when people have stayed at a location for more than three days. And I, I, you know, you can play this whole musical chairs thing, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's in line with the statute. He's on that property. He does not want to leave that room, and he's still being there. I think he's and he's probably getting his mail there. I think that is his home. Yeah. And if they don't like it, they should kick him out after 30 days and tell him to go somewhere else. Under an eviction notice on through, a, through the court. No, no, no. Within 30 days. Oh, oh within oh, 30 days. Yeah, it's okay. If yes. they don't, if they, they don't have... want to turn him into a tenant mm-hmm. and they let him stay over 30 days, even though they, they tell him to check out, check back, that's yeah. all games, man. It's yeah. all games. It's all mm-hmm. just, you know, um, what do you call it? Three card, what is that? Right, the shell, oh, the shell uh, game? Monty. Yeah, three card Monty. It's all, it's just, it's just all, it's all mm-hmm. game. It's all illusion. The guy still lives there, in my view. Right. Um, Zach, did you, and then a man, did you find anything? But yeah, you look at this, though. You know, he got behind on his rent, so they wanted him criminally trespass. Well, he's been there for a year. He's not a criminal. He's, yeah, he's not a criminal there. Well, you know, because he's what, not leaving? Yeah. Uh, I think Zach, part of this is a, a hotel has a little bit of a different connotation, too. It's more of a transient well, it concept, is. you know, for sure. As oh, yeah, yeah. The long term so, days, for sure. I see. I think that's what's going on here. These, 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 this probably this Kansas state statute is probably um, does not say anything about 30 days because not every state has it. Mm. I'm just teaching cops. That under a public policy, I mean, look, they're not cops are not lawyers, okay? They're not. Exp- I'm just teaching that if I was on scene, being a lawyer and what I know about the Constitution, I would say, hotel, you have created a after 30 days is a good round number. You've created a tenant situation. You've taken that risk. Now go just go get the piece of paper so everybody is righteous here and don't we don't create needless homelessness. He can go find another place or unnecessary criminal charges or unnecessary criminal charges. <laughs> Zach, um, tell me what you think about this. Um, well, the statute answers the question. It, oh, it asks, answers the question. Um, so the first one you gave, 604, that says the hotel owner can eject someone for not paying their um, their fees. But then the other one says this act, this does not apply to transient occupants of hotels, which is what this person is. So it doesn't apply. You cannot eject him. He must evict them. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I mean... Well, hold on. It does not apply to transient. Yeah, it says it does. This provision, the one, I, the 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 eject ejectment provision, does not apply to transient occupants of a hotel. Well, what's it? What's it? What's your definition? Well, what's the definition of transient? Someone who's in, who's entitled to stay there longer than like like a nightly rental. So these long term rentals. Mm, see, to me, so transient to me non-tran- means non transient. Is it non-transient or transient? Trans. It does not apply to transient occupants. I just looked up the L.A. County definition of a transient occupant. It is someone who exercises occupancy entire or to at a hotel by reason of license from the owner of the hotel. So this person is a transient occupant. Um, My mind means shorter term. Your state. Oh, so or- look. Okay. <laughs> We, we See, think me, of transient, transient as being not permanent, which yeah, which short is term. Not. I'm staying here for a few days. Yeah, kind of. I'm staying here for it's it's mm-hmm. transient. It's it's the opposite of someone renting an apartment. Like it's that's opposite long... than tenant. So, mm-hmm. do you it's think that quasi this guy is tenant? A... It's a quasi tenant. Do you think he's a tenant, or do you think so? Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to be confused here, but do you think that they can force evict him? No, or no, they cannot, they, they cannot, they cannot use the police to eject him. No, right. You have to go through the eviction process, and All the right. statute says it. And also, I think now, do you, what do you think about my my constitutional argument? Yeah. I mean, I think as a fourth of them, right? I agree with you. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a public it's a public policy issue. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, almost like uh, it's you know what it is. It's almost like a tenancy at will, right? Mm-hmm. So, in many states, right, tenancy at will is where you create this tenancy um, situation without a contract. You don't necessarily have to pay money. But it's you know a classic example is like when you let your ex-wife, um, you know, come back to the house to get back on her feet, and she's gonna be there to like, hey, I don't know how long it's gonna be, but I need help, you know, get back on my feet and so forth. And like, yeah, come back in. And then after like a month or so, they 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 fight again, they have an argument, and now he wants the wife to leave. Mm. Um, that is likely a tenancy at will, mm-hmm. and now you have to comply with the eviction statutes of your state. 
Even five without, day, even without written contract. Oh, even without a written that's contract, an it's, that's been set it's an court. agreement. Yeah. It's yeah. And, and why are why do the courts do that? They don't want to entice homelessness. Mm -hmm. Like now the now the yeah. ex wife is now a homeless person. Where am I going to go? Right. Yeah, and so you know we we don't have a homeless problem in this nation, but we could have if the wife does not have a place to stay. So all right, um, who's coming online? Sam. All right, Sam, bring it on. Hello, hello, hello. You know, love line. <laughs> <laughs> just turn, you, just Sam. You you um you should see like a little thing that says turn on mic, or unmute. And if it's not working, then we'll give you uh the phone number. Why don't you um uh, Rick? Why don't you in the meantime, uh chat him the phone number so we can get him on the 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 speaker phone. All right, let's uh, let's see what this one's about. We're actually doing good on these questions. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So this is South Carolina. So it says, my question is about the seizure of a person upon refusal to identify. All right. Officer stops a vehicle with two passengers, driver IDs per state law. The vehicle has a scent of marijuana. Maybe they bought that at the auto zone, <laughs> and it's searched, and paraphernalia is found that is not a criminal offense. Officer wants to ID the passenger, but the passenger refuses. We have no statute that equates to highball. Um, after flexing the pass, after the flexing, whoa, is he like twisting this guy? After yeah. flexing the passenger, flexing the passenger. After probably what was he trying to say here? After um, yeah, after yes. pushing him. Yeah, right. <laughs> these young kids, the way they talk, you know. Right? What I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I need a translator. I mean, what I that's what I do in the bedroom right there is flexing. So after flexing the passenger voluntary IDs, but the officer argues that they can they could also be charged, they could charge geez, or could charge with obstruction. Hmm. Okay. We have ordinances for obstruction and a state statute that equates to obstruction. I get it. I argue that without a statute to compel a person ID, they have no constitutional duty to do so. This was is this the guy? Oh, oh hold on. Hello? Sammy. Hey, well, hey, buddy. Hey, question? Oh, actually, you're on both. Actually, hey, uh, that's right. Hey, you're on both. I can actually, I can actually hear you um, through Zoom. So we're, we're gonna keep, we're gonna do that one. Okay. Um, I, um, you had a great show tonight, or a great class today. Listen, Listen I, I had a uh, situation a few weeks ago with CPS Child Protection Services. Now you are, are you a cop or the recipient of the CPS? I'm a, I'm a. Deputy Sheriff, uh, I'm, just, I'm just joking. You're, you're in Mississippi too. A awkward, if he said, "Well, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they just took my kids." <laughs> are you, are you uh, in Mississippi? I actually went to your class in Pearl. It was pretty. That was pretty good too. Oh um, man, that was a great class. And then Bubba up in uh, Rankin is a what a great host. Yes. Um, anyway, I got uh, we were asked to go over there to take uh, five children into custody. After getting over there, uh, I asked the CPS people for paperwork, girls looking for a warrant, or something signed by a judge. She told me she had a verbal order, and then I told her I wasn't going to help that I would stand on the street and be a peace officer. And she called the sheriff, and then the sheriff told me to go in the house and get those kids to bring them out. Was I above the law without the warrant? I look. Uh, turn it down a little bit. Might be some feedback. What's the, where's the feedback coming from? Oh, it might be from your, from your, from your, okay, mm, yeah. look. I, you know, I don't want to give you legal advice, okay? I'm just telling you, uh, let me just tell you what I would do if I was in the same situation. Is that fair? <laughs> if I was in the same situation and I was told, as I was a police officer and I was told by a government agency that I have a verbal order from a judge to go into a home and grab kids, right? That's what we're talking about, right? That's correct. I would absolutely not do it. With, I That's would absolutely refuse to do that. That's what and I did. They made me go in there. I would not do it. And I think um, I just would not do it. And um, I just wouldn't do it. I just, I'm just I just would not. Not with my knowledge. And I, and I would also um, I, I don't want to put you I don't want to pitch you between you and your bosses. OK, I'm just saying that that to me could be a clear violation of the Constitution to me because I need I need something solid. I don't need people's words that they are handshake deals of going to people's homes. When judges tell, when under the Constitution, when a judge 
um, orders a entry into a home, it's in writing somewhere. It's not it's not verbal. There's something in writing. I need something in writing so that I'm not violating people's rights. Um, that was what was bothering me because I felt that I was the breaking the fourth on them folks. Now they're that repercussion coming back on us. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Zach, do you have any feedback on this? I said, what was the delay oh, in not yeah. getting the actual written order? Was was there an, an, an urgency to get those kids out right now, or what was the delay with? Not yeah, getting is there urgency? They, uh, they, I guess the parents have been having some problems, and they decided to go get the kids, and uh, I was really uncomfortable with it. And I refused well, wait, hold, to. Hold, hold on, Can, let me just make sure we're on the same page, Sam. All right, who are the kids? Are the kids with a, a guardian or just like a family member? They were actually with the mom and dad. So where are the kids? Oh, oh, great. CPS is taking the kids. Of yes. course. That's why you said that. Yes. So just out of curiosity, though, take out this whole verbal warning or verbal uh, order business. Would there have been an emergency or some kind of urgency to get those kids out of that home because of imminent harm to the kids? Do you have any evidence of that or no? I did not. Okay. She wouldn't tell me anything. That's why I was starting to get a little upset about it. Um. Uh -huh. What do you think, Zach? You have any two cents on this? Yeah, just I mean, I'm glad you clarified that. I mean, absent exigency, and and of course, they don't have to. I mean, I think as a as a professional courtesy, they should tell you what their exigent belief is. But as long as someone in that work group has exigency, mm -hmm. um, then it's a good entry. Like if CPS has exigent circumstances, they're just not communicating them. It's still lawful for Fourth Amendment purposes, but absent exigent circumstances, the entry is illegal, and there's also due process issues with taking the kids, the familiar relationship issues with taking the kids without a, a court order. So, yeah, there's all kinds of constitutional issues. Um, and I also think we have a duty to intervene here. Um, I think that a cop in this situation, I think it would, it would be a clear violation to me that we are going into a home with verbal orders. I think a reasonable officer would, you know, would, I'm just, I'm not yeah. saying you or, you know, you're very put in a very bad situation. Mm -hmm. It's going to be your your sheriff that's going to ultimately be on the hook if this was unlawful, right, my friend? Well, kind of, yeah. Well, uh, you're, you're in the hook too. I mean, you're going to be named too if this was unlawful. But I'm just saying, I can see an officer saying, "No, I'm not doing it. It seems like a clear violation, and I want proof that this is mm -hmm. the." Now, look, if you get the judge on the phone, say telephonic. Yeah, you give me, there hey, uh, the, the judge is on the phone. Judge, are you approving this? I would go with that. That's good enough for me. I mean, at least we have the judge involved. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, if I don't have that, I'm not taking a CPS worker's word that they actually have proof. Because what happens if you get? What happens if you shoot somebody? You think about the emotion that's going to be involved in this. No, no yeah. matter what, you're going in. Yeah, they're you take some of these kids not wanting to relinquish those kids. Clearly, so yeah, there's a lot of yeah. And then you <laughs> shoot somebody in a uh, worst mm -hmm. case scenario, and then you go to court and say, yeah, I was the CPS worker that I don't know where she went. She moved to uh, Arizona. Mm -hmm. She told me that I can go in. Yeah. And then the well, judge was like, I don't, remember, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, was on the I appreciate board. the answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah mm -hmm. I, you, hey, um, you have my phone number, right? Yes, sir. Um, I would love to talk to your, if, I mean, if this is, I'm not trying to button to your business, but I'm here to help. If I can talk to your agency and maybe explain and, and some of the concerns that I have, uh, you give your sheriff my phone number and it's all nothing but love. I'm not looking to school anybody. I'm looking to help. I teach a lot in Mississippi. I love that state. And if I can help you guys, please let me know. I'll give you my two cents on this issue. Okay. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. You're sir. welcome. God bless you. You too, sir. All Thanks, right, sir. All right. So, are we? Did we answer the South Carolina question? Uh, no, we didn't. Okay. About so, flexing. about flexing. So, um, uh, look, uh, we have no statute. All right, look, I, I just if we have no if the, if if so, uh, um, Zach, are we positive? Do you know for sure? Actually, I have the, I have a, a list. But Zach, is South Carolina a? It's not a stop and identify statute or a state. All right. Well, I don't even know. I don't. Yeah, I don't believe it is, but I'm not 100% certain. All right, fine. Let's assume that it is for argument's sake right now. Yeah, but I don't um, know if we have a, an offense. Well, we, I think we the, may have, look. Passenger, do we? No, we, we may. We may have we may have constructive possession of marijuana. Well, the marijuana, right. Their paraphernalia is found. That's not a criminal offense. Um, but I have a little concern here. If they're believing on this, that they don't have this under their statute, they don't have a reason to identify this person. I'm a little concerned about flexing and voluntary in the same yeah. sentence, aren't you? So <laughs> here, here's our deal. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, let's look. I, I, I have the list right here. So South Carolina is South Carolina, right? So South Carolina does not have a stop and identify statute. Um, North Carolina does, if that matters to anybody. All right, there you so go. Uh, that doesn't help us today. So 
Yeah, you here. scent of marijuana, so I'm assuming smoked. Right. Probably right. So yeah. All right. So here's here's where we're at. Okay. So where we're at is, is here. So if you excuse me, if you're working in a state that um, does not have a stop and identify statute, and you tell them to identify themselves, it's it's an empty it's an empty thread. You can't arrest them for not doing something that the law does not require them to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. High bull basically upholds stop and identify statutes if you have one. Um, now, demanding one is probably okay. It's just it's an empty threat, though. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a Fourth Amendment issue, really, to say I need your I need you to identify yourself. But they say I'm not identifying myself. You can't do anything about it because right. there's no law being broken. Which was high. Number two, if we I think we have reasonable suspicion here because they seem to be in a common enterprise of yeah. possession of narcotics. So fine, detain them, run your investigation. But at the end of the day, if you never develop probable cause that they were in, uh, involved in criminal activity. Then they have to be let go. That's not obstruction. Yep. Zach? Just be uh, I agree 100%. I have, I have nothing intelligent to add. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Um, All right, Matt, you're yeah. the last, you're the last, you're the last caller, I think, right? Yep. Oh, Matt's calling me on the phone. Okay. Yep. He's got a Peyton Stegall question. All right, brother. So I've been told. Well, he called already before. You don't oh, have to be an a hole about geez, it. Hit the second call, man. Sorry, Matt. Jeez. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> so, my, my question is regarding uh, Spiegel and, and search warrants and third party homes. Yep. Um, if, if you have a search, if you have a, a warrant that you're trying to serve and you see somebody or you see the, the subject through the window of the third party home, do you still have to have consent by the homeowner to enter the house without a search warrant? I uh, definitely. Or... Yeah, mm -hmm. I got your answer. It's it's a uh, you you got a you got an arrest warrant for a subject. He's at a friend's house. You see the subject inside the home. Do you need the occupants of that third party home's consent, express or implied, or can you just like he? Let's say you knock on the door. The occupant, the homeowner answers. You just walk on in. That's the question, right? Yes, sir. All right, I got you. Stay right there, just in case we have follow up. Um. Well, Zach, why don't you take this one first? Uh, this is an easy one, but it's a common question, a mm -hmm. common misunderstanding. No, you cannot just walk in. You need cons uh, every home entry. The crossing of the threshold requires consent, a warrant, or exigent circumstances. Crew, come on, Re reinforce the crew here. Right. That's the well, time and, to shine with over crew, here. With crew, the only recognized exceptions here are consent and exigent circumstances. That's correct. All um, home entries require some form of exigency. And remember, this right. is an arrest warrant for the person. An arrest the warrant, home. right? And the now, arrest warrant carries the implied authority to go into the arrestee's home or to intrude upon his expectation of privacy. This whole situation here is about the homeowner's Fourth Amendment rights, not the arrestee's rights. So you're saying that the the restee he cannot he's likely cannot sue for the home entry. That's correct. The entry but, but the is lawful as sue. to him. Yes, the entry would be lawful as to the arrestee, but it would not be lawful as to the homeowner. Now, Zach, I like to think in I like to just do ext extremes because extremities when you when you ride the edge of things you find out where the faults are. Yes. If we went into that house and bypassed the homeowner and the homeowner is a, highly offended at his government is entering his home without judicial authority, his consent or agency, and he fights, you know, he kind of resists the, in, the unlawful intrusion and he gets hurt or killed, um, are the cops going to be in hot water on that one? Yeah, we're going to get the checkbook out and write lots of zeros at the end of that. Uh, Maybe some commas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, commas and zeros, lots of them. All right, there's your answer. That's, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely correct, right? We're violating the homeowner's rights and we can't violate their rights either. Okay, yeah, because uh, I've been told by... The guys at my agency, guys at neighboring agency, time and time again, that oh, if we have eyes on this guy that we're trying to get on the warrant through the window, you don't have to have consent. And I've I've just agreed with them over and over, and I'm like, I don't I don't agree with that. I think you're, you know, stepping on 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 wrong toes doing that. But well, you know, um, but here's the thing. This is the, this is the beauty of your question. Um, Zach already gave you. Well, you actually gave the case, didn't you? Say Stiegeld or who said Stiegeld? Mm -hmm. Said, he did. He did. Well, yeah. Then we're good. You 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 have the case that says you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I've, yeah. I've, I've I've read through Stiegel, but I wasn't sure. If at some point, I missed the part where, like, whether if it was reasonable suspicion that the guy was in there, or if it was well, he had, they had probable cause. Yeah. Well, they don't. Well, remember, a hundred. There's nothing. Very rarely do you have a hundred percent certainty on a lot of things, but when it comes to criminal law, right? It's uh, they had probable cause that he was in there. Uh, what was his name? Uh, J Jimmy? No. 
Lions. Yeah. Jimmy. Jimmy. It was, was it? Lions. Uh, it was Lions. Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. the uh, guy they were looking for, right? He was the guy they were looking for, mm-hmm. but of course, Steagle got wrapped up in it because they found what, co- like bricks of cocaine yeah. or whatever was, inside the house. The lion's phone came back to that house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the point is, is that you have the case. It's Steagle. Mm-hmm. And okay. the, his rights were violated. That's why he walked on the cocaine case. And now after, now after Steagle, the, the, if that happens again, we can sue police officers for blatantly, not blatantly, clearly violating his rights. That's why it cannot happen. It will, it, it will not happen. That's Cops cannot do that. They cannot have a lust for the bust, right? You know, <laughs> just slow it down. you got to get judicial authority to be in there or consent. Now, just since you're on the phone, Matt, um, you know, just as a, as a side, sidebar, if the suspect says, no, stay out, and the homeowner says, yes, come in, well, you know what we're going to do. We're going to go in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he, he has greater authority of their home. Mm-hmm. Wait him out. If he's at his friend's house, he'll leave. Or throw a flashbang in there. Do something. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come out. <laughs> all yeah, right, good and, question. And Matt, I want to emphasize. I, I hear I get this question all the time. Matt and Matt points it out. It's it's this is not this issue is not about how certain we are he's in the house. That's not the issue. The issue is whose house he's in. Mm-hmm. So we the fact that we're a hundred percent certain he's inside is irrelevant. Let me to, tell you. Yeah. He'd have a shirt on with my name and date of birth on it. No, no. He can say, hey, I'm here. So um, in here, let me just tell you, we're going to end off here. um, But let me tell you a classic example that there's an actual case from, I think it was Kansas, but uh, because they violate a lot of rights down there, as we found out tonight. So (laughs) they they have an arrest warrant for this guy, okay? Now, they heard that he's staying at the cousin's house, um, apartment, apartment. They knock on the cousin's apartment. The the cousin, the non-wanted person, right? The cousin opens the door. He sees the police there. And who's on the couch playing Xbox? Your guy. The guy the that they wanted. And what do they do? Push the past. Yeah. Push past the cousin, the owner, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the occupant, and go grab him from the couch. And I was like, hold up. You just violated that person's rights, the person who lives at that apartment. And you should have seen their faces. They're like, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense to us because we can see him. Mm-hmm. He's right there. And we have an arrest warrant. We can see him. He's 10 feet in front of us. He said, you didn't violate his rights. You violated the other guy's rights. And if he goes to a lawyer and sues you, you will pay him because it's been clearly established, what, 1982? Something, 1984, something like that, Stiegel? 81 or 82. Yeah. Yeah, they're, and, and so Willie says they're going with plain view. And that's another thing that we hear all the time. They oh. think if you can see it, you can touch it. <laughs> and as that. a judge said, okay, I forget, uh, learned hands or something like that, he said, as, as old hands at the burlesque house, no, you cannot touch everything you see. <laughs> there you go. I mean, you know, we, we're, in, we're in Vegas. We, we, we know that. You can't touch everything you see. <laughs> right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Man, uh, Zach, I thought this was an incredible show. I'm That's really fun. glad you were on here. You added a lot. Um, I've learned some things, too, so yeah. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and Mike, Mike good, good talking to you for the first time. It yeah, will be the last time, I'm sure. Yep. So um, thank you guys. I think that's all we have for you. And that's it. So we'll see you next week. Thank you guys. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you.